Hello, good afternoon. We're going to take a virtual tour of the Missoula Smoke Jumper base. So come with me, we'll go inside and take a look at the facility. Come on in, everybody's welcome. So welcome to the jump base. And I'm going to give you a fairly brief tour of what goes on here. Consider that the jump base is like a firehouse. Group risers, hand tight, chest strap properly routed, properly seated. And our fire engine is an airplane. So everything that goes on in this facility is based around getting firefighters quickly out to the aircraft to respond to fires. The United States Forest Service developed its own airborne squadron, smoke jumpers, parachute firefighters. One answer to the problem of fire in remote roadless areas. Smoke jumping started in 1939 as a test program for the United States Forest Service and the first fire jumps were conducted in 1940. And some 80 years later, we still perform the same service in putting out new fire starts in the backcountry. Most of these fires are started by lightning and require us to fly by aircraft, find a jump spot that will work for us, and then we parachute to the ground, take off our jump gear, go to the fire, and put the fire out while it's small in size. That's the bread and butter of the work that we do as smoke jumpers here in Missoula and the other bases that are th scattered throughout the United States. In Missoula, we have about 70 jumpers that work here through the summer season, and that starts usually sometime in May through October. Oh, hello there. Well, this is one important part of the jump base. This is the manufacturing room. And as I was saying before, smoke jumping has been around for 80 years. And since it started so long ago, and there was really no idea about how to, what gear was going to be needed for jumping out of an airplane and landing and going to the fire, they started making their own gear. And that's a tradition that's been passed down for generations of smoke jumpers. We all know how to sew. So in this room, we make a whole variety of different materials or use a variety of different materials and make different gear. We make our own gear for working in the woods, pack out bags, uh, harnesses. We do all our own parachute repairs uh, on our sewing machines. So when you come here as a new smoke jumper, you learn how to sew. It's a really important feature of our job is being able to manufacture our own gear because it's very specific. It's hard to uh, get people to build it for us specifically. So we build it ourselves. It's a tradition that's passed on from one person to the next. And uh, this is one place when you're a new jumper, you come in here and you learn to sew and you uh, uh, have some trials usually, uh, problems, but you learn how to sew and you get good at it and comfortable with making all kinds of gear. As you can see in this room, they're building some red and yellow bags. Those are going to hold reserve parachutes on the aircraft. There's all kinds of material and fabric in here, a whole variety of different machines, bar tackers, sergers, heavy duty sewing machines for all kinds of heavy material construction. It's a pretty great place to work and you learn a lot of good skills. And this right here on the floor is a PG bag, otherwise known as a personal gear bag. And this is a bag that we use on the fire. And you can see it's got water bottle holders and pouches and things like that for holding all our gear that we use when we're working on the fire. These are all built here in the manufacturing room. They're built like uh, the assembly line for a car, one piece at a time to construct this piece of gear. And this is what a person will use out in the woods. You can see that it's been it's pretty dirty, it's covered with sawdust, um, it's covered with mud and all kinds of debris from just being out in the field. And so this is your bag, this is your kind of your home when you're away from home. It's got all the things you'll need to do your job once you've landed in the jump spot and you're heading off to the fire. So we'll go on to the next part of the base which will be the 
loft and the tower area where we do our parachute uh, inspections and rigging of the parachutes to get people ready to go jumping. Come with me. You will see. All right, now we find ourselves in the tower. When you come back from a parachute jump, the first thing you have to do is take your parachute in here and inspect it. And that means you have to check all of the fabric on the parachute and all the lines and make sure that they're not damaged from the jump. Once the inspection is completed in here, the parachute is then taken into our loft area, which you'll go to next. That's where the parachute is packed. In here too, you, a lot of times you're able to dry out gear that's been wet out in the field and get a lot of debris out of it. And oftentimes that's gonna be lots of branches, pine needles, insects, other things that get into the canopy when you're just out there in the woods. So it's very important that you come in here and do a thorough inspection on this device because this is the life preserver that gets you to the ground safely. Once you've done the inspection, you log it in a book that's in here to make sure that it's documented that you have done this safety procedure. And then you take it into the loft and it's packed by a rigger on one of the tables in that area. It's a step-by-step -step process that leads to a very safe uh, system that we operate with. This way. All right, so we've left the tower, the parachute's been inspected, now it comes into the loft. And as you can see, this is a huge area with lots of different tables. The long tables are for packing round canopies. The tables towards the back of the room are for packing a ram air canopy, which is called a square style canopy. On these tables, the procedures are done to pack a parachute safely so it can be used by a smoke jumper when they get called to a fire. Um, packing a canopy takes uh, quite a bit of practice and skill. Some people are very fast at it, others go a little more slowly, but it's essential that every step is done correctly so that a parachute will open in the correct uh, uh, you know, way. You don't want to have a parachute uh, improperly packed that will cause a malfunction. So everything that goes on in here is documented and written down in books, and the parachutes all, are all marked with a, a date of packing and they have to be repacked after a certain passage of time. Um, so everything is, uh, that goes on at this jump base is based around a thoughtful consideration about people's safety and being able to do their jobs efficiently. Um, smoke jumping can be very dangerous in the parachute aspect and then working on the fire itself. So we strive to create a culture of uh, safe activities and a focus on protecting one another and coming back from the fires uh, in one piece. As you can see on, these, on this table right here, this is a round canopy that is kind of in the final stages of being packed. Um, it just needs to, be, be, to uh, be sealed up and then will be put on the shelf for someone to use when they need it. You can see on the walls behind me, these are all the areas where the parachutes, once they've been inspected, are put and then they can be packed into their containers. So it's a pretty high speed place during the summertime when it's busy and a lot goes on in here. Over towards the wall there, you can see more sewing machines where uh, we do work on the, on the canopies, also uh, building uh, harnesses and other parts of the, uh, the, the equipment that we use for jumping. Uh, it's a very precise business building gear and so you have to be pretty skilled at sewing to be doing some of the construction that goes on in here. All right, well, we find ourselves in Loadmasters. And Loadmasters is a place where we build all our cargo that we're going to use out on the fire. 
Once we jump out of the airplane and parachute to the ground and get safely out of our jump gear, the airplane will then fly at a very low altitude and kick cargo out that is dropped by smaller parachutes to drift into the jump spot. This is just an example of some of the cargo that we get on the fire. This is two food boxes, and this is a five gallon cubitainer of water that we drink out of because we need a lot of water when we're out in the woods. We don't use the water to put the fire out, we use the water to keep ourselves hydrated and in the, the good state of mind for working safely in the forest. In each box, is a, a, you consider that two of these boxes would be used by two jumpers. In each box there's a sleeping bag, uh, more water, and a lot of freeze dried food, and then a tool called a Pulaski. Now this Pulaski has got a tool guard on it, but this is what we use in the woods for constructing fire line. Sometimes the fires we jump are a quarter of acre in size or smaller, just a single lightning strike tree. Other times there's several hundred acres in size and it takes a lot of effort to get a line around a fire. Using a Pulaski, you dig a trench along the fire's edge to separate the burning fuel from the unburned fuel, and that way the fire will just burn itself out and you can stop the fire from spreading. This is a tool that's been around for a long time. It's got an ax and a hoe. It's the pre predominant tool that we use in the forest. Of course, we also use uh, a variety of chainsaws. This is a very small chainsaw. We have a lot of uh, issues cutting down trees that are weakened by fire. And so that's one of the more dangerous activities that we deal with in wildland fire are cutting down trees that have a potential to fall across the fire line or cause uh, havoc when they burn up and then fall in an unpredictable manner. We also use the chainsaws for cutting logs that are down on the ground out of the way and brush. On occasion, we also will jump fires in the backcountry wilderness areas where a, a chainsaw use is typically prohibited. So we use crosscut saws and we'll do work that way also. Um, that's just a different old school form of work that we do. Uh, as you saw earlier, we eat a whole variety of freeze dried foods. Spam is a, is a hot uh, thing that we like to cook over the campfire. Uh, all of this food is really salty. It has a lot of calories. Uh, in a normal day, a firefighter, if working very hard, can spend, you know, burn over 5,000 calories a day and drink up to six to eight quarts of water just to stay hydrated. So there's a lot of need from this cargo. It's very important that we get it to the ground and, and uh, we're able to carry it to the fire and use it. And so load masters, again, is another huge feature of making uh, the fire station work and getting our aircraft out to the fire with all the supplies that the smoke jumper is going to need. So, yes, a lot of activity here during the summer when we're busy. All right, well, now we find ourselves in what's called the ready room, and as the name implies, this is the place where you come get ready. This is uh, usually when they, lay, they let off the siren in operations. You run in here and you put on your gear, as quickly and safely as possible to get out to the aircraft. Oh, and I'm holding a picture of my children. That's my daughter and that's my son. I never get to see them during the summer because the life of a wildland firefighter is a constant uh, job of being gone on the road. So I never get to pick huckleberries with them, but they taste good in the winter. All right, so, okay. So here we are, this is my locker. It's a bit of a mess, don't focus on that. We've got all my gear here that's ready to go, and this is like the layer of an onion that I put on when I get ready to go to a fire. I've got my, my jump coat here, and this is all made out of a Kevlar material that's puncture and rip resistant and lots of padding inside, as you can see. Like it's designed to protect my body when I land on the ground. And let me restate that this is the gear that I wear to the fire. This is Nomex, this is the type of uh, flame resistant material. And these pants are Nomex also. And then I have heavy duty uh, fire boots on or leather boots that protect my feet. This jump gear that I wear is only for the jump. It gets left in a pack out bag, a big stuff sack at the jump spot. And then we go to the fire in the gear that I'm wearing right now. Now all this gear that is in, hanging by my locker is made at the base. Again, I, we talked about manufacturing. We build all this gear here. And so this is my jump pants, my jump coat. This stuff is very heavy. It's really padded. You sweat like a beast in it when you're uh, in the, during the summertime and it's super hot in the airplane. But this stuff will protect your body when you land. Because you can do everything right under the canopy, but as soon as you land is the place where you can get hurt. So this is designed to protect yourself so you can go do your work on the fire and put the fire out as quickly as possible. Also here, this is my jump helmet that I wear. You can see that it's a motorcycle style helmet with a steel face cage. This is designed to protect my head and my neck and of course my face 
from uh, if you landed in a tree or you landed in the terrain that had lots of rocks and logs. And most of the terrain that we jump have lots of rocks and logs and trees. So the chances of encountering those objects is high. So this gear is designed to protect you as efficiently as possible. And that's there. And then in my, my locker, of course, I have all kinds of other gear for doing my job. I've got my jump harness. This is a very important part of the gear. This harness is what my parachute's attached to. I have a parachute on my back, which is my main parachute, and then a parachute on my front, which is my reserve parachute. Should my main parachute suffer a malfunction, I can pull a red handle on my reserve and have an extra parachute come out to help uh, stop my fall. But this harness is, of course, a huge tool that has to function properly. These are also made in our, our loft, and they're made to very, very precise uh, specs and they have to function perfectly, otherwise that would be a bad situation for those using them. This is uh, the reserve parachute I use. You can see the red handle here. If it would be on my chest in a jump, if I had an emergency, I would pull the red handle and it shoots out a spring-loaded drogue parachute that then flies up in the airflow and pulls out a canopy and opens up above my head to uh, help me in case of that emergency. Um, and then this right here is the PG bag when it's kind of uh, packed up nice and tightly for jumping. And this is what I would be tying off to my harness right here on my, my waist. And this is, you know, will be once you get to the ground, you undo all your straps and it turns into a backpack. And this kind of demonstrates, again, the craft of all the things that we make here. All these objects that you've seen in this video are made here in our manufacturing room in our loft sewing area. And I've had this bag for many years. It's very durable. It weighs about 25 pounds, fully loaded with a couple quarts of water and all the tools that I'll need for working out in the woods besides the chainsaws and hand tools that come down in the cargo. The PG bag is, again, like I said earlier, your home away from home. This is where everything that you're going to need for doing work is contained. All right, so we find ourselves here in operations, and this is the nerve center of the jump base where all the planning and implementation of activities goes on. When there's a request for a fire, for jumpers to go to a fire, the order will come here, and then the order is then, of course, processed, and the jumpers that are gonna to go to the fire are called out by sounding a siren, and then those folks will then hear the siren, and they will go in the ready room and get their jump gear on, and usually that takes anywhere from about two to five minutes to get all the gear on, get a check to make sure it's all on correctly, and proceed out to the aircraft to fly away to the fire. Operations deals with a lot of, of different things that comes through during the summer. It's a place where you really have a lot of uh, conversations going on about what needs to happen for the day and how the aircraft are gonna be used. So it's, a, again, a, a big deal. Over here to my, my right is a whole list of names and that's all the jumpers on the list. And typically it works from top to bottom. You rotate from the top back to the bottom when you come back from a fire. So the list is a very important thing. You don't touch the names on the list. It's a, a bad thing to do. So it's only up to the people that are running operations for that day to, to deal with moving names around. Um, so yes, this is operations. It all goes down right here. And I'm going to sound the siren for you so you can hear what it sounds like when we get a fire call. And that is the siren. And so any smoke jumper that's worked here for a long time, when they hear that sound, they get kind of a twitch and they almost run for their stuff because that's the thing you hear that says, I need to get my stuff on quickly. It's time to go to a fire. They're starting the airplane up, we're leaving. And so as I started, said at the start of the tour, this is a firehouse. Everything that goes on here is focused on getting people to the aircraft as quickly as possible and out into the sky to go jump fires and put them out. When a smoke on a remote mountain is sighted by a lookout and radioed to the dispatcher, then it's fire on the mountain. This is the payoff. Ten 
tenseness while they fly the rough air over miles of timbered ranges to that point of smoke that marks the objective. Directing the pilot over the course he's chosen, the spotter drops a drift chute to check on the erratic and often treacherous wind conditions. It landed near the spot. First two jumpers, this is it. Only a few men jump at a pass, sometimes only one, because the clearings they try to hit are small. that dropped them also delivers their supplies. Firefighting equipment, food, even drinking water. Parachuting these things from treetop height. Safely landed, the jumpers signal the plane that all is well. Operation routine. Now the thrills are over, and the jumper is just another firefighter. A man with calloused hands doing the necessary, unglamorous job of grappling with a forest fire. Jumpers almost always get to a fire while it's far enough for one man to control. But for the sake of safety, two men are always dropped. And by getting to a smoke in time, smoke jumpers save thousands of dollars, as well as thousands of acres of our forest resource. Sometimes when an unusually strong dry wind blows a fire out of control, larger concentrations of jumpers are used. Descending in force, to hold and put out the fire that threatens the life of the forest. With the fire out, equipment must be tagged for pickup by pack mule. Then, the one problem smoke jumping doesn't solve, the long hike up. In fulfilling its charge to protect range and recreational resources, the Forest Service is constantly striving for improved methods of fire prevention and control. Lightning fires cannot be prevented, but man-caused forest fires can. Every man his personal responsibility and be careful with fire in the forest. You do your job, the smoke jumper is doing his.